Hello, and welcome to this session about promoting yourself and your research. These days, final publication isn't the end of the story. You need to think about how to reach out to potential readers of your work and promote yourself online and in person. There's lots to think about here. So we're going to talk about some different ways that you can build your online profile and showcase your research in different venues. The important thing is to think strategically, and this session will show you how. So it may sound obvious, but it's really important at the start to take a step back and think about what your goal is with your promotion. This will help you to build a successful strategy to achieve that goal. You might have multiple goals or different goals for different projects, and this is absolutely fine. The whole point is that one size doesn't necessarily fit all. There's probably no shocks on this slide when we talk about why you should promote your work, but it's worth going through it just to think about all the different reasons. So firstly, you need to tell people it's there. There's been a huge growth in the amount of research in different available formats in the last few years, and you can no longer rely on people to explicitly seek out your work. You need to shout about it, go to them and tell them why it's worth their time to read. Promotion can mean greater exposure for your work. The more time and effort you take with this promotion, the more visibility it will have, especially if it's openly published. Readers can then just click a link to take them to the relevant page and see your work without the extra barriers of joining a library or trying to find it in a journal subscription. Promoting your work can open it up to new readers. So thinking strategically about how and where you share your work means you can reach out to potentially lucrative audiences you'd not thought about before. Now, this could be lucrative in terms of financial gain, but also lucrative in terms of your career. So can you make new connections? This leads us on to our next point, as promoting your work can help to enhance your reputation, both within and outside your discipline, and indeed within and outside academia itself. The more people become aware of you and your work, your reputation will start to grow over time. And you might find that you stand out more in an area or discipline that you hadn't previously considered. So you may have been very, very focused on capturing your colleagues' attention within your part of the discipline, but it might actually be that your research has applications in a wider area of your discipline. So it can really help to, to grow and enhance your reputation and lead to future projects, which takes us on to our final point there, finding collaborators. Promoting your work can lead to potential collaborations because people who might not have come across you otherwise will find your work online. They will see what kind of the topic you're researching, what the quality and standard of your work is like. And the more you reach out, the more chance you have to make a, a bigger impact with your work in terms of finding potential collaborators. So in the world of open research, Things are no longer only about that final publication like a journal article. This final publication represents only the tip of a much bigger iceberg of research outputs that you can share. There are lots of different outputs or potential outputs from a single product project, which means that there are lots more chances to reach different audiences with different aspects of your work. If you look at the diagram on the screen here, you've got the, the final publication, as I said, is the tip of the iceberg, but you've also got everything that's going on underneath the surface. So on the left hand side there, you've got actual outputs that you could share. So the data that underpins your publication, your research log, could you write a, a preprint for wider sharing? Is it worth sharing codes or protocols that you have developed during your research as well as that final publication? And then on the right hand side, we've got the often sort of hidden academic labor when it comes to, to sharing uh, work. So things like peer review. So if you've ever been asked to do any peer review, this might be um, a useful thing for other people to know to promote yourself as a, a potential peer reviewer. Or if you sit on any editorial boards or do any informal help or review for, for colleagues or mentorship or something like that. So there's lots of different things going on underneath the surface. When it comes to considering which aspects of your research to share, there's, there's a few things to think about. So think about whether you want to share purely academic formats or whether you want to look at more popular formats. The traditional system of peer-reviewed research has been seen as the gold standard of publication. 
but it's only popular within academia itself, really. This is kind of an academic bubble or echo chamber that you might want to get out of and reach a more um, diverse audience. So you might want to consider more popular formats which appeal to this broader audience. So things like popular academic magazines, things like The Economist or The New Scientist, that still share that academic content and information, but in a less formal, less standardised, more accessible way than the typical journal article. You might want to think about traditional formats like journal articles or book chapters. These follow a very specific set of academic conventions, but there might be newer methods of sharing your research that have come about in the last 20 years or so. So could you record a video, something like a TED talk, for example? Could you blog about the process of doing your research, share your updates via Instagram? Not all types of research are suitable for this kind of new methods of sharing. But I think it's a really good way to think about different ways to showcase your work and how you might stand out from the crowd. And then the final thing to consider is whether your work is open or paywalled. So open access research aims to make the outputs of academic and often publicly funded research more widely available to anyone with an internet connection. The more people who have access to it, the greater the potential audience and so the greater the potential out impact for your work. You need to think about how accessible your output will be and whether there are any cost implications for this. So do you want to make something available open access? Is this something that is mandated by your funder? Is there a charge for this? There are lots of different models of open access and things to consider, but I would say that making things openly available does help to get it out there so people can actually read it. And the other side of this is that Access is great, but people do actually need to be able to use the material as well. So if you are, for example, releasing the data as a separate um, thing that is published in Microsoft Excel, that's great. But you need then Microsoft Excel to access it. So maybe think about something like Open Office or an open format or a Google Sheet, something that more people can have access to without having to pay for Microsoft. The key thing really is to think creatively about all the potential outputs and formats that you can mine from a single project and then use these to start planning your strategy. These days, one of the most important things you can do in terms of promotion is to build a professional online presence. It's likely that you'll have some kind of digital footprint out there already. And if you don't take control of what it says, then you won't be able to determine what people see about you when they perform a search. A good online presence can have lots of other advantages as well. It can help you make new connections and collaborate across geographic boundaries. It can help you reach new audiences with your work. It can certainly help you build a reputation beyond the walls of your institution and promote your skills and knowledge. But it also helps to disseminate your research and your ideas to this wider audience. The first step when building a professional online presence is to put yourselves in the shoes of a potential employer, supervisor or collaborator and do an online search for yourself. Use a few different search engines so that you can compare the results and get an idea of what different people will see. So use things like Google, Bing or DuckDuckGo and then compare the results together. Think about how close to the top of the search results you appear and whether others with the same name appear higher up because these are the ones that people are more likely to see. Ideally, you want to appear on at least the first page of any search results. Once you've found yourself, look at which profiles, which mentions appear. Are they professional or personal? Is this an issue? Are there profiles that you would want people to see or would you prefer that they didn't see these particular ones? Are you reflected as you would wish to be, or are there any problems which need addressing? Can you see what other people are saying about you and your work? So things like citation, citations, mentions, appearances in the media. Can you see the context under which you're being mentioned? And don't forget to check the image results. What do these say about you? This is often where mistakes slip through because people will get very focused on the kind of textual content and setting up a professional profile. And they forget that how easy it is to tag people in images of nights out on Facebook or something like that. And then those creep into the image results. So do have a look and see what is out there. 
the best step is to start with thinking about the profiles that you already have and how you can make best use of these. Do they need updating or do they need adding to? What can you utilize without too much extra effort? So think about things like your institutional profile. At Cambridge, we have Symplectic Elements, which offers the tools to create an institutional profile. It helps to pull together all of your outputs for the ref and for reporting purposes, but it also offers space to add things like achievements, publication, work information. This means that you will connect directly to Apollo, which is our institutional repository, and it can be configured to automatically update your profile with your works. And it works with lots of other major university systems as well. So for in Cambridge, it's a really useful way to create a simple, robust profile. However, it's not yet publicly viewable. In theory, in a few years, this should happen, but they've been saying that for a few years already. So at the minute, it's Cambridge only, which may not be ideal. The next one to consider is ORCID, Open Researcher and Contributor ID. A lot of people have one of these already because it's becoming increasingly necessary to sign into lots of different research systems. This is a single point academic profile, which again brings together things like your works, your achievements, your roles, your education, under a single permanent identifier. So a bit like a DOI for a person. It offers uh, a one-stop shop approach, so everything can be brought together on the one page. Funders and publishers often require one, so you're going to need one anyway, so it's a useful thing to have. Perhaps the biggest benefit of ORCID is that it stays with you throughout your career and any changes, so it's very good at picking up things like name changes for whatever reason. If um, you leave Cambridge and go somewhere else, you don't lose access to any of this because it follows you around during your career. It's a really, really useful thing to have. The only slight downside is that while you can set a lot of it up automatically to automatically populate your ORCID profile, it might need manual intervention for something. So it might not pick up more niche works. Sometimes it gets things a little bit wrong. But overall, it's a really, really good tool to use. And I would say if you, if you pick one thing, ORCID would be the one to have. Next up, we have database profiles. So popular databases like Scopus, Web of Science will often create author profiles in their process of indexing work. With many of these, there's a limit on what you can do as they're controlled by an internal algorithm, so they're done automatically. But you should at least be able to correct any errors if you find them. So if you find work that is wrongly attributed to you, for example, that's a really simple process to correct that. Another downside of these is that they're only based on the material indexed in that particular database. So it won't be an exhaustive list of everything you've ever published. So for example, your Scopus profile will only list the works that you have published that are indexed in Scopus, and this may miss out uh, other publications as well. So that's a bit of a downside to be aware of. But if you've authored anything that's indexed in these databases, it's going to have a profile of some sort, so it pays just to go in and make sure it's correct. Then we have open peer review profiles. So traditional peer review is an anonymous process, and it's often the, that hidden academic labour that we talked about earlier. The open peer review model flips this on its head and allows reviewers to obviously be more open with what they're saying in their review, but it also allows them to sign their names to their work. So this not only helps to make the process more transparent, but it also helps to showcase your work as a valued expert in your field who is available for peer review. There are several sites like uh, Publons, which allow you to create a profile and get recognized for your review work. And that can be a really, really useful promotional tool within academia. And then we have the academic social network. So specifically sites like researchgate and academia.edu. These were actually designed to bring together both the benefits of a, a typical social media account and academic network. So they, they're kind of sort of Facebook or Twitter, but specifically set up for academia. So yes, they do allow you to create a profile. They allow you to bring all of your works together. They even allow you to share them directly with an audience you know have an interest. So 
very unlikely you will get members of the public on these sites, but you might get uh, other academics within your discipline looking for material on there. A big downside to these websites is that they are commercially available products. They are not uh, repositories in the true sense of making something open access. They can unfortunately encourage copyright infringement because they encourage you to share the outputs of your work on them. So a, a journal article, for example, and you may not have the, the legal right to do this depending on what kind of copyright agreement that you signed. So you have to be really careful to sh not share things that you don't have rights to. The best policy is that with these kind of sites is yes, have a profile because they are quite well indexed when people look for you, but it's really important to only share links to legitimate online versions of your material. So whether this is the original published version on the journal homepage or whether this is an open access version in a repository. So that's the best way to use these tools. And then the final one to talk about is Google Scholar. So this is Google's version of the academic profile. And it won't surprise anyone to know that these are quite highly indexed when people are using Google as a search engine, because uh, obviously it's, it's the same product from the same people. So it performs really well in uh, Google searches. So it will get you out there. It does offer the ability to track your citations and interaction, although as with any citation tracking, this is limited to only what Google Scholar has access to. And yes, it has access to a lot, but not everything. It is, as I said, a commercial platform. So that may um, not be something that sits well with you ethically. That's a personal decision. And you may need intervention to correct wrong automatic matches. So it's a bit like the database profiles we looked at earlier, it, it creates matches. And so if you've got a very common name or there is a researcher with the same name in a different field, you might find that you get a bit mixed up. So next we're going to look at general social media sites and whether you can use any of these professionally. The names on uh, this page are going to be familiar to you from uh, sort of normal social media use. There's too many tools to cover everything, so we've gone for the most popular ones and those perhaps best suited to sharing research, especially sharing it outside your discipline. So the first site that I always mention is Twitter, which uh, many people will know is a micro blogging site. So you can only share short updates, although they have recently upped the limit of characters that you can use. So it's really good for putting short, punchy updates out there and linking out to other sources. So I've published a paper. Here is the link to that paper and you can get that out really, really quickly and easily. So it does reach a large audience because you don't always need an account to view just sort of one-off messages. On the downside, there's a, a short word limit, so you have to be quite, um, quite good at distilling your research down into its key points. And it's best described as a bit of a fast-flowing river, especially if uh, you follow a lot of people, a lot of people posting updates quite frequently. Those updates can get lost, so you might need to schedule two or three updates on the same thing to get maximum impact. Now, aware that I am sitting here talking to you in early 2023, there is a lot going on with Twitter right now, which a lot of people have different opinions on. So you might not be somewhere that you feel welcome anymore. It might be um, somewhere you want to look for an alternatives. The best alternative that has been suggested so far is a site called Mastodon, which pretty much operates on the same sort of model when it comes to sharing things. It's just a bit more managed, unfortunately, as Twitter used to be and no longer is. So if Twitter is no longer for you for whatever reason, Mastodon might be worth exploring. The next site I want to mention is Instagram, and a lot of people immediately go, oh, Instagram, in terms of sharing research, that makes no sense. But this is where it can help you to stand out from the crowd. So Instagram shares um, videos and images, really, really useful for any visual updates of your work. It's popular with a younger audience. So if that is what you want to reach out to that kind of younger demographic, then Instagram might be worth looking at. 
it's not used by that many researchers, although there are a growing number of them. So it's a really good way to stand out from the crowd and capture attention. However, not all research works in a visual format. You might just find that your, uh, your research overall, your particular project is not very suitable for this work. And it takes quite a while to prepare good content that will, will look good and reflect well in your research. And this may not be time that you have in your budget. So we've talked about sort of static images and Instagram starts to share videos now as well. But what about YouTube? Obviously, that's been around a lot longer, the most popular video sharing platform in the world. And I think the third most popular search engine in the world as well. Lots of people searching for video content on Twitter. The pros are that it shares things in a popular format with an extensive reach. So lots of people now prefer to look at a video rather than uh, read lots of text on something. And again, it's different from the traditional research updates that your peers likely to do. However, as with Instagram, it can take a lot of time and effort to produce a good video and get good results. So you might find that you need to leave this only for when you've got something really important to say that is suited to that format. It's, it's all a balancing act and see whether you um, have time to do it and whether the effort is worth the payoff. And then the final site that I wanted to mention is LinkedIn, which is the much maligned networking tool for professionals. It's been around quite a while now. It's very well established. It has made moves into like integrating blogging platforms and making that kind of sharing of research easier, but it's, it's still quite um, professionally focused. You can share links to and updates on your research on there. You can create an instant online CV really good for highlighting specific achievements and research, really changeable so you can update it quite frequently. However, it does have quite a business focus still because that's how it was set up and that might not suit you and the audience you're trying to reach. Whichever site you end up using, we've got some tips to help you improve your visibility. Try and create links between different platforms, especially if they complement each other. For example, can you promote a website where you share your content on your Twitter profile? This can really help people to find you and your work across different platforms, whichever one they might be using in different situations. Try and create a brand and keep your form of name and image as consistent as you can across that brand. This will help people to easily identify you from just a quick glance. It's worth taking the time to try and source a high resolution professional image of yourself that you can use to do this and remembering to update it every few years so it stays current. Many websites and social media tools will let you create what's called a vanity URL. So for example, on LinkedIn, your LinkedIn profile could be linkedin.com forward slash your name. This looks a lot better when you share it. It's easier for people to remember and again, helps to tie things together. Try to be consistent as much as possible, but if you've got quite a common name, you might have to adjust a little bit. So for example, when I did mine, my name was taken. So on LinkedIn, I'm my name and then librarian after it. And that's how I distinguish myself. And think about whether you can contribute any work to existing websites or blogs. So for example, a department internal webpage. This saves you from setting something up, but it still helps to get your work out there. If you have quite a scattered web presence, then you might want to try a site that brings everything together and creates almost like a digital business card. You then only need to share a single link with people in order to find everything that they need about you. So there are several different examples of software out there. So the example on the screen is an about me page, but there's also services like Linktree and Card. A lot of these offer a free version. You might have to pay for increased functionality. Again, try and use a professional image as your headshot. It's always better to have an image of yourself than a blank space or a standard avatar. And if you use the same one across different um, sites that you're on, it does help to tie everything together. Try and include a, a single link somewhere prominent or as it termed on about me, a call to action. So you can see on this example, on this screenshot in the blue box at the top there, 
it says view my portfolio. So that's what I want people to take away. I want them to go and have a look at my portfolio online. So I've made that the most prominent feature. Include as much information on your profile as is relevant. So if you have like a personal CV statement, you could use that to essentially tell people who you are, what you do and why they should be interested in you. And then add links to the other sites. So make sure everything linked is on brand. Don't just link things like your personal Instagram account unless you're comfortable with people seeing that in a professional context. So these websites will often let you link the kind of most common uh, sites out there together on one page, and then you can just share this with people. Conferences are a really popular method for sharing your research, and they're a great way to promote yourself. Especially in the climate we find ourselves in, there might be some issues around accessibility. So the cost of travel and attendance is quite a barrier to a lot of people. If you have caring responsibilities or you might not be able to take time away, there's lots of issues about attending physical conferences, but there has been a rise in digital and hybrid events in the last few years, although there might still be some barriers to attending these. There are two main methods of contributing to a conference with your research, conference presentations and conference posters, and we're going to look at each of these in turn. So presentations, require you to be present in some form and comfortable with public speaking. So whether this is in person or online, you are going to likely stand up in front of some kind of slide deck and you are going to do the speaking. Now remember that in these situations, your slides are there to support you. You are the main attraction. So what I normally say is like your slides are almost like your backing singers, but you are the star of the show. So you really do need to be present and comfortable with speaking in public and communicating to do good presentations. Treat your presentation as a way to create a story with your research. Have a beginning, a middle and an end and plan everything towards the key message, the key takeaways that you're trying to convey. Beware of offers to attend conferences that might seem a little bit too good to be true. So so-called problem or predatory publishers, which are those who exploit misunderstandings about open access to charge you to publish your research, they are branching out now into um, conferences and offering presenting opportunities. So you might get a very flattering email asking you to, to come and present at this conference or even keynote an event. But actually, these come at quite a high cost to you. And there's going to be little or no benefit really to you attending. There have been horror stories of you end up just everyone who's attending the conference is also a speaker and you end up talking to the same 10 people the entire time you're there. And there are better ways to spend limited funds than attending those kinds of events. Another way to showcase your research at a conference without having to formally stand up and present, at least not in the same way, is to do a conference poster. You might still need to present to people or talk to them, but it's more of a one on one interaction than speaking to a large group. So if you are quite new at this, if you're perhaps uncomfortable with public speaking, it's a really good way to dip your toe in the water and get some experience. The important thing is that you don't try and turn your entire presentation, your entire research into a poster. They're different formats and they need different approaches. So what you're trying to do is give a broad overview of the project with links to more information. And then you can be there to talk to people in more depth about certain areas. Posters can be physical, printed out, they can be digital, or you might have a choice of both formats. Each approach requires thoughts about different elements of design. So, for example, embedding links in a digital poster to more information or explaining things maybe more fully than you would in a, in a print poster because you've only got a limited amount of space. Use the poster to highlight your top takeaway from your research. What are the key things that people need to know from your project? And make sure that you pay attention to design and try and design an effective poster as I said, it's not your chance to cram everything you know about a topic onto one sheet of paper. It's your chance to make the best use of the poster format to give that overview of your work. So this is a very crude example of what a conference poster would look like. 
this is not the only way to do it. This is just to highlight some key um, things to think about. At the end of the day, your poster is a form of presenting your work, so you need to give it a structure. Introduce your research and outline your results and your conclusions. And just as with an in-person presentation, you need to tailor this information to your audience. What are they most likely to be interested in? So your introduction will be a brief overview of the project. Remember that your readers don't need to know absolutely everything in, in full detail, but just, just a gentle introduction to your project to set the rest of the poster in context. Your results are likely to take up the main body of your poster. And it can be really good here to use some eye-catching graphics to, to summarize data and things like that. But try and keep these to a minimum so you don't want lots and lots of different graphics because that looks too distracting and cluttered. Whereas if you have one or two well-chosen, carefully placed graphics, that can really help to grab attention. And then your conclusion briefly highlights the main points and maybe next steps that you want to take in your work. Make sure your audience can read your poster from a few feet away. If it's a, a physical poster, so this means that you need to think about using the appropriate font and font size and make sure the information is clear enough that they can actually read it. With posters in general, less is definitely more. It can be really tempting to try and put lots and lots of information on there, but that only makes things look, cl look cluttered. You want to leave lots of white space around the text and include images relevant to illustrate your points, but again, only a few at a time. Somewhere on there, you need to include further information and contact details so that people can follow up with questions. So if they happen to see the poster at a time that you are not staffing it, then they want to, to know who wrote the poster, whose research this is, and how they can get in touch with them. So really important to put your email address on there. When you're designing a poster, Think about accessibility, avoid using complex color and font combinations. So consider people who suffer from color blindness, for example, and don't use um, reds and greens, don't use colors to make things stand out. This is all starting to sound very, very complicated, I know, but you might want to check if there's a standard departmental template you can use, which um, will tell you which different fonts and things to use. So that might be a, a way just to keep the process a little simpler for you. When it comes to presenting posters, you may be asked to stand next to it at a given time during the event and answer questions in person. And this, as I said, can be a really good introduction to presenting if you're new because it, you do have that more one-on-one -on -one interaction rather than standing up in front of an audience of hundreds. And you can have lots of really interesting in-depth conversations about your research as well. So that's a slight advantage of the poster method over presentations. With all this talk about different methods you can use, I think we often overlook the, the more simple methods of promotion, but there are a few low cost, high impact things that you can try. These are sometimes referred to as quick wins because they, they don't take very long, they require minimum of effort, but they can have a, a big impact. So make some use of your email. Think about the, the number of emails that we send in a day. If you include a link to your latest paper in your email signature, for example, or if you're out of the office at a conference, you can put details about that conference in your out of office message. People might follow that up. Or you can put a link to your blog or website or other um, online presence in your signature. Anything that starts to get that information out there is really good. And it's, it's a method of communication we all use anyway. Might as well make the most of it. Think about whether there are any existing in-house publications like newsletters that you could contribute something to. This will give you a ready-made audience, but there's the minimum of effort because you just contribute a short piece and it automatically gets sent out to people. Think about sharing multiple outputs from a single project. So if you think about the research iceberg that we looked at at the start, you can share that final publication, but are there any other outputs like data or methodology that you could share alongside that? Could you share these throughout the project as it progresses in order to get people interested in that eventual final output? Think about all the different formats you could develop from the work that you already have and the work that you've already done. And finally, always consider the importance of language when promoting your research. So different audiences will need the same information expressed in a slightly different way. 
So always remember to use the language that's appropriate to your audience. If you are using language that is very academic to an audience of the general public, they may not understand, they may switch off. It's not the best use of a promotional method. You could sign up for a service like Kudos uh, with OK, which guides you through the process of creating an accessible summary of your work, including a little bit of self-reflection about the things that you learned on the project. Even if you don't want to use a formal service like that, it's a really useful exercise to get you thinking about how you might communicate your work to different audiences. Something we get asked about a lot in this area is search engine optimization. So you can use the same tricks company used to sell you products and services online to promote your work. You can be quite um, clever and sort of trick these search engines into indexing your material and rank it so it appears higher up people's searches. When people are just randomly looking stuff up online, they'll probably look at a maximum of two pages of search results. Realistically, probably only the first few hits on the first page. So you need to get it as high as you can so people will actually look at it. The main factor in this is the keywords you use because this is how search engines index their material and then how they um, search for it within the uh, stores. So think about the keywords you use in your own searches. Use a, an online keyword generator to help you think of appropriate keywords for your output. And think carefully about which audience you want these keywords to appeal to. So if you are looking at an audience of your peers who are going to be looking for the academic terminology, you want to put the keyword, the academic terminology. in. if you are looking for an audience of the general public, you might want to use a simpler form of the word or a more well understood form of the word that's less academic. So what are people likely to, to search for and how can you um, use that to promote your work? Think about where you want to place these keywords. Obviously, the title is the place most people go to, but it's not always appropriate and it can look really obvious. The best advice is to try and include these keywords early in the title if you're going to use them. So within sort of the first 65 characters or include them in the first couple of lines of an abstract, but don't fall into the trap that some people do of, of putting lots and lots of keywords in repetitively thinking that that will get them higher up the search results. This is known as keyword stuffing and it can actually trigger these websites to unindex your work. They, they kind of, they're onto this and they unindex it. So yes, put keywords in, but put them in where appropriate and not too much. Think of your title and abstract as the shop window to your research. So this is the first thing the reader is going to see to entice them to want to know more about your work. You can try and make it search engine friendly, as I've just said, but you can also develop academic and non-academic titles. So if you think about lots of um, popular websites like Facebook or Twitter, you might see these what they call clickbait titles. And that can be quite a useful exercise. So the idea is to get people intrigued so they want to explore more and they will then click through to your research. So again, if you want to reach out to a wider market, that might be something that you want to consider. A lot of people don't know that graphics can also factor into the calculation of rankings in search engines. If um, you are using graphics in your work, if you can, image-based graphics like JPEGs and PNGs actually make it difficult for search engines to read any text that is within them. So they can't read labels on a graph, for example, if it's in that format. The recommendation is therefore to use text-based vector graphics. So things like SVG or AI instead, because then the search engine can actually pull out information from those graphics and use that to index your output. And finally, remember the metadata, because that's a vital part of the rankings. Metadata is, information about the information. So it could be things like keywords, but you might also want to include file type, the name of the publisher, the name of the institution. And this will again help search engines to rank your material. It will help it to appear in more searches because if someone is specifically searching for uh, PDFs on a given topic or presentations on a given topic, the information is right there and it's more likely to be returned in their search results.
you need to sort of think outside the box sometimes, get a bit creative when promoting your research because this does help you stand out from a crowd. So there are a couple of examples on the screen here. The one on the left is from a piece of work that I actually did. This was done by a professional service that the, the journal employed to do it, but there's no reason that you couldn't draw your own. It's a cartoon abstract, so a, a graphical representation of your research. They don't have to be as detailed as this one is on the screen. They could just be a, a single cartoon that you can share online. And sometimes that's all you need, but it can help to grab people's attention. People are more likely, I think, to look at images or as they're scrolling through to have their attention captured by an image than blocks of text. So that might be something that you want to think about. There's also things like uh, on the right here, we have screenshots from the wonderful Dance Your PhD competition. The screenshot at the bottom there, which is to do with pig valves in heart operations, was actually a, a local winner. Those uh, students are from Cambridge. This is an annual competition and it tasks people with representing their PhD through dance. The results are shared on YouTube. There is some money involved if you win, but it's really a fun, perhaps silly way to get your research out there. Again, it might not be something that your research is suited to. It might not be something you have time for, but these are just illustrations in order to get you thinking outside the box, alternative approaches that you can use. If your work is really significant and you want to actually do a, a media campaign, then the university does have a media office that can work with you to create things like a press release if that is something that is of interest with your work. So that's another method to think about, but basically just have some fun and capture some attention. The important thing to do with any promotion is to be strategic and plan rather than just jumping in or relying on methods that have worked before, because every piece of work is different and they'll need to be promoted in their own way. There are so many different methods to choose from that it can be really overwhelming. So the thing that I recommend to people is that they use a bit like the backwards design method that was developed for teaching, where you start with what you want to achieve and you work backwards to design something that will do this. So start by thinking about the audience you want to reach and which elements of the research would appeal to them the most. Think about the outcomes you want from your promotion. So are you looking for a higher hit rate and more citations? Are you looking to reach out beyond the academic bubble? What is it that you're aiming for? And then choose the best method or methods that will meet these goals. And you need to do this for every project, for every piece of research. And if you plan it in this way, knowing what you want to get out of it, that will help you to be more strategic about the methods that you choose. You need to go in and review how you use it for personal promotion, depending on changing goals. So how you promote yourself, when you're looking for a, a job might be different from how you sort of generally promote yourself in the context of your discipline. So you need to review these things occasionally. And although it is a time commitment to do this and it might not be something you think you have time to do, it can save you a lot of time in the long run and actually make your promotion more targeted. So whichever approach you decide to take, there are some things to consider. So we just wanted to leave you with our top tips. Think about your quick wins. Where can you make a real impact and get good reach with as little effort as possible? This is also an exercise that can perhaps help you decide where it's worth spending a bit more time and effort depending on the outcome you want. So if you think actually writing that full journal article and pursuing formal publication is really what I want to do because that will have the impact I want, then that is where you should spend more time. Make sure that your outputs are as accessible as possible, no matter which audience you're aiming for. Add appropriate keywords so they can find it, share it in places they have access to, and try and use accessible formats so that they can actually use it once they found it. If you have multiple profiles to update, this can get overwhelming and exhausting quickly. So consider which elements of the process you can automate. There's lots of different services out there now, which will let you cross post updates on social media channels. So things like Ift, If This Then That and TweetDeck. And these um, can help you to populate lots of different sites at a single click. 
And there are sites as well like Orchid, which will automatically go out and look for updates for you. And that leads me on to my last tip. If you only have space for one online profile, I'd recommend that you make it an Orchid. It collects all the information you need, including roles, education and outputs, and it's used as a sign-in mechanism for multiple different research services. And it can be set up to gather a lot of information automatically. It's a really useful tool to have. It's something that a lot of people in different disciplines use. It's probably my number one recommendation for promoting yourself and your work. So if you have no time to do anything else, investigate creating an ORCID and really putting some time into it. Thank you for listening to this recording. If you do have any questions, my email address is there and I'm happy to answer questions at any time.